Um, so we're going to talk about um, R6 today, um, following up on S3, which we did last time. Um, oh, I gotta do that. So the so okay so the the also, I want to start off with kind of the big picture stuff going on. So last time we talked about S3, which was um, functional uh, object oriented programming, where the methods um, belong to the generic function. So you have a class of objects and all the ways that that that, that class of objects is going to be handled uh, lives in the functions that are separate from that class. Um, the alternative that we're talking about now, which is what R6 is, is encapsulated OOP, um, where uh, not just the stuff that we saw belonging to the objects last time belongs to them, but also the methods um, belong to the objects. Um, and we'll see what that means exactly. Um, and the other, the bit that we'll have in the back of our heads and then come back to at the end is that, which is a big feature, is that um, R6 objects um, have reference semantics, which is the same thing as saying they're always modified in place rather than being copied um, when you modify them. And we'll see like it has some powerful stuff that it can do, especially when you are trying to like model something that has all these different components that you wanna have held together and you wanna be able to change them. Um, but it also can produce weird code, uh, weird results in code that's hard to read because of that. Um, and I'll have some examples at the end. Um, and then the last bit is that there's only one library, even if this is R6, and we'll only use one function from it, um, which we'll see right now. So I, I'm gonna do this by basically, it pretty much goes in order the chapter, but I'm gonna do this by basically saying a little bit about creating R6 objects and then a little bit about using R6 objects, and then a whole bunch more about creating them because that seemed like that was how the chapter was laid out and it made sense to me to do it that way. Um, so the main way you create them is with this, uh, this function of the R6 package, R6 class. Um, and, what, and the thing I'm gonna use to kind of go through this is there's a question in there, it's 14.2.6, like the first question, it asks you to create this little bank account object. Um, so I figured I'd do that and we'll, I kinda, I'll add to it as I go and we'll kind of see, uh, I created some examples with that. So hopefully, I thought about making a, a vote counting object, but I decided it would be inappropriate. <laughs> Just kidding, I did. Um, <laughs> no, it's all bank account. Um, so yeah, so this gives you the main, main functionality. So the first argument is the name, um, of the class uh, bank account. And um, after that is just, is the internals of the, of the, of all of the objects of that class. So it's, you're basically just passing in a list um, that contains two kinds of things. Uh, a bunch of them are, are methods, which are just functions. So there's a deposit method um, that's a function. And then what the book's gonna call fields, which is basically anything else often a value like this, like zero, but um, could be an object or something else as well. So in this case, um, we're creating a little bank account object and it's gonna store um, this balance field that starts out as zero. And it's gonna have two methods where uh, when you call the method, it'll let you add some money or withdraw some money. Um, and the thing to note, the only other kind of thing to note about this is this self dollar sign business, um, which is basically how in R6 objects, how you like tell it, hey, I'm referring to something inside this object. Um, so when you see self.balance, that's telling it, oh, okay, I'm looking for this, not like balance somewhere floating around in the world. Um, and same thing. It, so yeah, so the so the only thing here is is self dollar sign balance. Um, the last bit before I sh before I show you what this looks like is I think Hadley had mentioned basically said you're creating an R six object that is a class of objects and you're gonna save it you're gonna bind it to something that should have the same name. So bank account is the name of the class here because I put it right there. Um, but it's helpful to also have kind of 
it going to this other object that has the same name. So it should always look kind of like that. Um, so I'll show you what, it, what you can do with this. So um, the way for all, like whenever you've created your R6, so you've created your R6 class and you now have this bank account thing. Um, and the way you create a new R6 object, which is a member of that class or an instance of the class is with this new method. So I'm gonna say the, the class object dollar sign new. So that says, okay, create a new um, bank account object uh, and I'm calling it checking. Um, and then you can access all of the different methods and, and fields um, by using that dollar sign, kind of just like you saw with the self uh, dollar sign bit. So to access the balance, I would say checking dollar sign balance, and that's going to pull the, the zero that was there. And then similarly, um, you know, I can call the deposit method. So I gave it an argument of 10, and that, as we saw, was going to increase the balance by 10. And then I check the balance again, and boom, it's 10. Um, so that's that's the so those are that's kind of the how you would kind of use these things in practice. Um, so, oh yeah. So the other bit about using them um, is this notion of of chaining methods, which uh, I think would have looked weird, but it's kind of like it's the pipe stuff that we're all familiar with probably makes that more comfortable. Um, but you can kind of for for methods that that what their thing is doing is is changing something in the object, which are like having side effects, basically. Um, you can kind of chain them together like this. So in this instance, remember our balance was at 10. So I withdrew 10 and then I withdrew 10 again. So the balance is going to be negative 10 now. Um, and the way that that, the, the reason that I was able to do that, this is just showing you the what the withdrawal method looks like, is that I invisibly returned the object itself at the end of the method. So when I call this checking dollar sign withdraw method, it literally goes in, updates the balance internally to the object and then returns the whole object, which makes it so that, you know, calling this returns the object and I just get the next, the object back so I can keep going. Um, and the suggestion here is like, whenever you have methods that uh, their purpose is to is to have a side effect. So to update, not to give you something, but just to update like an internal value of the object or do something else, you should always have it invisibly return the object so that you can do this kind of thing. Just like if you're writing a function that can be piped or whatever, you would have it return um, the data frame or whatever it is. Totally analogous idea. Um, so getting a little more into the weeds of like, so that's how you use them, right? Getting more into the weeds of like other things you can do with defining these classes. Um, uh, so some, we saw like the deposit and the withdraw method that I made, those do, you know, they're basically like functions that you can just call. Um, there are some methods that are like special because they make the objects of your class behave in like different ways. So the, the examples that uh, Hadley gave in, this, in the book were the initialize method. Um, so when you set that for a class, it basically determines how the new uh, method call will behave. Um, so here, this is the same bit, but I added an initialization method that just lets you set a password when you, when you, um, when you uh, create a new object. So before, you know, I was just creating an object and there's new is just totally whatever. It's like, so there's no, uh, I don't have any ability to set anything when I create it, but I created this initialize function. So now you can pass it a password and it sets it, you know, it sets the uh, internal value. And then, you know, to make my, this make sense, I added um, that bit to my deposit and withdraw function. So it's going to check if you, if you put the password in. And if it's wrong, it's going to be like, it's going to throw an error. Um, and the other bit, and then you can see how it works, is this print method, um, which just determines how the object um, is printed when you print it or you just call it itself, um, non-invisibly. So here I just said, 
what's the print method? It's just going to say balance and then say the balance formatted nicely. That's all it's doing. So to look at what actually happens, um, so I'm making a new object of the class, right? Of uh, my bank account class, I'm making a savings account. And this time now when I call new, I can set the password. Um, so that's gonna you know, set that password field in the object. Uh, and if I, if I try to run it with the wrong password, right? So I, passwords don't tell, but the, I you put password one, two, three, my, my best guess. Um, it'll throw an error and say, that's wrong. You, you can't do that. Um, and uh, alternatively, to see the print method, right? So here I put the right password and I deposited 10 bucks and um, I just had it return it. It normally returns invisibly, but I just had it return visibly. It prints like this now. So it says balance $10. Um, so that's, those are how those, those methods work. Um, one thing that this highlights, which is important, is that um, you might expect, hey, I, I changed the class, right? We added these new methods. So all of my objects that, that are instances of this class hopefully got updated as well. Um, no, that's not how it works. And it's important to remember that. So this is our old checking object. So remember, I made this before I updated the class. And when I try to print it, it doesn't have the print method. It just shows this crappy looking, this is the default print method. It just basically tells you a bunch of stuff, um, almost like you're looking at a list. So it's using the default print method. And you can see, um, oh yeah, so that, that, that was the only example there. And then um, the, oh yeah, here's what I'm doing. The, the point is um, make sure you rebuild your objects when you change the class, which is what I did here. And uh, now it works, right? So I, I recreated checking, um, but now, but with my, the class is now, you know, right. And now the print method works. Um, but I think the, the big lesson there is if you're, as it will only matter if you're like doing stuff and creating classes and testing stuff out, you might have like these objects floating around. If you're like me, you probably like, run little pieces of your script in like silly orders to test stuff and aren't careful. And you might confuse yourself if you're changing objects and don't like rerun everything fresh. Um, but hopefully you do that because you're diligent and you know, not me or whatever. Um, okay. So the next piece, um, the, the next component about how these things work is this idea of um, inheritance. Uh, so it's similar to kind of these, the um, hierarchy of classes we saw in S3, where you had like one object that was like a sub object of some other. Um, so in the, in the, um, the question that the ask was actually to make a bank account where like, if you go below zero, it like charges you lots of overdraft fees, but I, I went a different way. So I made a socialist bank account in this case. Um, so this is going to be a, a subclass of my bank account, and um, I'm going to do. And I did a couple of things. I, I'm going to. Uh, so I, I made it that way by putting using this inherit argument. Um, inherit equals bank account when I created this, uh, and all of the methods that I don't explicitly overwrite, it's just going to get from um, it's from the from the parent class. So specifically, what didn't I overwrite? So We'll see in a second, but like for keeping your mind, like I didn't overwrite the print method and I didn't put the print method here, but that'll stick around. Um, what I added is, um, is basically what's going to happen is every time, if you, you have your bank account and if you go under zero dollars, if you go negative, I'm sorry, if you deposit more than a than a hundred thousand dollars, if your balance goes above a hundred thousand, it's going to cap your balance 100,000 and say from each according to their ability in the log. And if you go below, it's gonna give you a hundred bucks and say to each according to their need, okay? So this is how bank accounts should work, right? Um, so just kidding. So well, maybe, who knows? You don't know my politics. Um, but <laughs> but uh, the other, and the other little fun thing that I did here, just I was like proud of myself that I 
put the functions working this way is I made this little check balance function as a method, and then I'm just calling it in, in deposit. So um, it's going to do the deposit and then um, do this check balance. And I'll tell you in a second about this super bit. Um, so the first thing to notice is that the subclass, right, inherited the print behavior. So that worked because I didn't change that. Um, and the other thing to notice, I'm just putting out the deposit method again for you here. Um, I didn't rewrite the whole deposit method, right? Like most of what this was doing was actually using the, 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 the parent class's deposit method, right? It's doing the same thing, um, but it's just doing it and then doing an extra little thing. So I don't have to write that whole thing out. I can refer to the parent class's de deposit method with this super dollar sign as opposed to self dollar sign. Um, and that's just like next method in S3. It allows you to like delegate work um, to methods belonging to classes that are higher up in, uh, in the hierarchy. I also think it's like way clearer to me. Like this made a lot more sense to me, like using that super bit than next method. I was never like really clear, like where you should call next method or like where it's where it's handing off control or like what is happening. But like this, I think is actually super clear. It's like, yeah, I'm calling this function and I'm telling you where to find the function and that's how you do it. Um, so I like that. I That was made me much happier than next method, to be honest. Um, so what else happened? Oh yeah, this is an example of how it works. So looking at the deposit method um, here, we uh, withdrew $10. So we, we made our balance negative and then it, it gave me $100. So it works and it, it spit out our, our mantra. Um, so, and then what else is, it? oh yeah, the last bit is um, our six objects, they get, they get S3 classes in the way you would expect. Um, so, uh, and it recreates those like inheritance relationships. So this is the class um, of my R6 object. And you can see like its highest priority class is socialist bank account. Its next priority class is bank account. Um, so that, that kind of works and that allows, in theory, right, right? Like if you wanted to write an S3 method for your R6 object, like you totally could do that as well, um, I assume. Actually didn't try, I just thought of that, but you probably could and I'm, I'm sure you could. Uh, and um, it would, you wouldn't have to do anything super special, right? It would like work well. So, yay. Um, a little uh, additional kind of details on um, other things you can do with these objects. Um, so we've been kind of putting, I told you at first it was like this list argument We've actually been putting things into the public um, argument of, of R6 class, um, where all of the fields and methods you give it are like public access. So like, for example, here, you know, I can just call the password and it'll like tell me what it is. So maybe you don't like that. I don't know, like that's kind of a bad way to set up your passwords. Um, the well, you also have the option of making anything you want in your R6 object, in your class, um, private, like just internal to the object so that the users can't interact with it in the same way. And you do that by, pa instead of passing a list to the public um, argument, you just pass it to the private one. So here, what I did was I basically said, um, in this new secure bank account, uh, my balance will be public. Um, but when I initialize, instead of saving my password in the, as a field in the public space, I'm going to put it in the private one instead. Um, and then I'm going to go look for it. You know, when I look for it, I'm going to look for it in the private one by, instead of calling self dollar sign password, I'm going to call private dollar sign password. Um, Yep, so this is just kind of the example of how that would work, right? So I initialize my secure checking account. And now if I look at secure checking dollar sign password, it doesn't exist, right? 
presumably it's looking for, it's looking in the public um, side for some field called password and it's not finding anything. So it's returning null. That field's hiding in the, in the private um, one, which I can call internally using this private dollar sign, but externally I won't be able to, users won't be able to access that in the same way. So that kind of covers the, the gamut of um, like tr fun tricks and stuff. Um, so now I'll kind of go to the, the reference semantics bit, which is just like, how can we get in trouble with this and what's this doing? So R6 objects are always modified in place, which means if you, if you want to get a, a copy of them, um, you can call the clone method to like create an exact copy that's separate. Um, so you can see I got kind of lazy here. I was just like, here's what the book said. But um, basically like this can make, um, this can make these objects harder to reason about. Um, so in this super, honestly not that helpful example from, from the book, um, the, the idea is like, if X and Y are just like base objects, we have an expectation um, about how uh, calling that function f is going to change, like what objects are going to change, right? It's going to take x and y um, and maybe do stuff with them and save something to, to z. So z is going to change. I know there's probably, you could probably write um, a function that like messes with x and y too. Maybe you can, I don't know. But usually that'll be the case. That's like not guaranteed to be the case um, if X and Y are um, R6 objects, right? For example, like just think about like, what did we do with R6 objects? We called methods on them. In our bank account, the, all the methods did was modify the objects themselves. So if X and Y were bank account objects and you, and you called this function F and it, you know, used any of the methods for X and Y, it's definitely gonna do more than just change Z. It's gonna change X and Y because um, that's the way we configured things. So uh, this no longer means, you know, only Z is changing. It, it likely means X and Y are gonna be changed as well, unless you're really careful. Um, but, right, but that also, I promised whoever was here last time that we talk about like, Hopefully try to talk about um, the, the question in the book, right? I'm actually putting it here is, why can't you model a bank account or a deck of cards with an S3 class? Um, and right, the answer is just because of reference semantics, right? So when you copy an S3, when you change an S3 object, it's copied. So like the best you, and I actually tried to like recreate the bank account thing with S3. The best you can do is like, have a generic that just returns a modified version of the of the object. Um, but it's not like that's pretty different than what we were doing because you know, then all of my calls would be like bank account, assignment operator, generic function with bank account as a as a right. So that would be kind of clunky already. Not to mention the fact that if your S3 ob your R6, whatever, no, your R S3 or R6 objects, if they're, um, if they're big and have a lot of stuff in them, then it's definitely a bad idea to having to have methods that keep copying them every time they're changed. Like that's a terrible idea. So, um, so that's kind of the, the key like part is that you can go in there and, and change things. Um, the last kind of bit here um, is this other, this other thing that makes these hard to reason about and can mess you up sometimes. So um, there's an example in the book that I didn't find that clear about like temporary files and databases and stuff, but I tried to like break it down to its like fundamentals here because it's helpful for me, but hope, so hopefully it is for you. But if it's just confusing, then just like go look in the book at the, the temporary database thing. But basically you can get into trouble if the, if the, the default value in your class is another R6 object. Um, so here I, I made two, I made two classes. 
One is, and they're both silly, like not useful classes. One is just this number class. So all it does is it just holds a value, right? It starts with zero and then you can increment it with this method that just adds one to the internal value. And then there's another class that I made just called number pointer, which just, it's just gonna hold a number, um, a number object. So it has one value and, and the actual value of the field is a number object. And when you create the new a new number pointer, it's going to initialize a new number um, object. So the problem here is that presumably what you'd want to do is like you would create a new number pointer object and you could mess with its number and then you would create a different number pointer object and you could mess with its number and they wouldn't be like connected in any way. But when you configure things in this way in R6, um, they actually are gonna share this object. So that'll be clear here. So here I, I am initializing two uh, new number pointer objects, X and Y. And right, I'm checking the, the value of X, right? It's saying X, look inside the number and tell me the value. So it's zero, as I set it to be default. Y, it's also gonna be zero. Right, so now I'm gonna inc increment the, the number in X up by one right? So now X is one. I would hope that Y would stay zero, but it's not. It's also going to be one because under the hood, those two X and Y, these two number pointer objects share the same um, underlying number. So when I change one, it, it's going to change it for the other one as well. Um, and I didn't work on creating an example to make it clear how to fix that because this already, um, you know, we're already this deep, but basically um, the, the way to get around this is by making sure if you want to have an object stored as the value of some field in your R6 class, make sure that you like initialize it in a method. So typically you'd have like in that initialize method, you would, um, you'd have it create your your new object so that every time a new R6, every time you initialize a new R6 object of your class, a, a new kind of like default thing in there gets created and they're separate and don't, don't overlap at all. Um, so this is the last bit. So the question is how, how have I do I use R6 in my work? I've never used R6. I never heard of it. Um, so I never, but honestly that is, Maybe someone can tell me. Is I I guess like is shiny using R six? Is that why it's like input dollar sign whatever? Probably. But what this did remind me of, right? So is that I I'm uh, R is actually know a lot better than Python, but I'm learning some Python now for this um, this machine learning class. Um, and like R six type objects are like super common in Python apparently. Um, and right, so like definitely if, if you're familiar with any of the Python stuff, like a lot of the algorithms, um, that, uh, that, that, you know, like Python implements and stuff, uh, for optimization and machine learning actually behave just like R6 objects. Um, a week ago when I was like, oh, I should make these slides. I was like, maybe I can like try to create some of this in R, but I definitely did not do that. But to give you a sense of the idea before I end is um, like there's a whole bunch of, of things when you're doing like an optimization problem, you, you're doing some like iterative thing where at every step you're changing something with the function and wanting to store and update a whole bunch of values. And you can kind of imagine it's really useful to have an object that like has the instructions for taking the next step in your algorithm and all of the values you need, like all stored in one place. And you can kind of like do that really nicely by just putting that all in an R6 type object and just kind of like keep calling it to update it um, and have those internal values be packaged in with it. Um, so that's occurred to me as like where this would be really useful. Um, and yeah, that's all I have, 30 of 30, slides are done. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll get to use more R6 at some point. Um, I have no idea, but, uh, it seems, it seems useful and like you could model kind of cool things with that.
Oh, yeah. All right, that's all I got. Was there, what were the parts of this, I guess, that had other people tripped up or like, I don't know. I just want to say nice job. I really appreciate your examples too. Uh, they're entertaining uh, and also informative. Um, I thought it was kind of funny, uh, or in, yeah, I guess it's funny that uh, like in the socialist bank account example, uh, it's not only a socialist bank account, but it's like a Schrodinger's bank account because like it has one value. And then if you want to check the balance, if you call the check balance function directly as like a user, it would like change the balance if you were above that level. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. That I was unintentional that, though. <laughs> but it's kind of, I just say, I just say, I thought it was kind of funny uh, that like, it just like, I don't know, it was, it was, it was cool. It was a cool example. And uh uh, so I just thought I was like chuckling a little bit, um, but uh, no, nice job. Is is really? I thought you did a really yeah. good job. Yeah, it's, it's really helpful. Yeah, just, I just don't know when I would use it. It hasn't been doesn't come up. Yeah, I did a similar uh, like uh, Python reference, I guess. Uh, like. Recently, I was working with this type of model um, that's basically like, uh, have you guys heard of like an agent-based model? Uh, basically, it's like you um, you create uh, a bunch of um, independent uh, objects that are like, have certain characteristics uh, that are like, let's say they're people. And then each object has like attributes and stuff. and they have like rules about interacting with each other. And then you kind of like iterate through the, the like a function where you're calling like a step for each object over and over again. And you kind of see how like rules at the, at the agent level can uh, percolate or, or uh, kind of uh, emerge. There can be patterns that emerge at the system that like you wouldn't expect from like the interaction. So it's like to simulate like a system. Uh, anyway, but but like this type of thing is really helpful because you want each agent to have a certain set of characteristics and then you want them to start in a certain place. And then when you create them and then the, the have them update uh, like on their own over and over again, um, you know, so they maintain a value, they have methods for interacting with each other and, um, and rules. And like, then you have like all these kind of uh, different objects that are that are, you know, in different places in in space and whatever. Like anyway, uh, that's the only type of thing that I've. But it's not R. Not in, well, you could do that in R, but yeah, that was a Python thing. Yeah, that was the same experience I had. Was was I do some work in Python, um, and it, this just looks like Python in the same sense it's like the functions are built within the objects and yeah it just it seemed very similar to that um the only thing i found uh tricky was i didn't do a socialist example but i did the you know the uh the the the, the slightly more greedy example of actually having uh, overdraft fees and trying to figure out how to get it so it use um super rather than that and figuring out that like if you put super withdrawal inside it, it like calls it then and figuring out that's like, if it's in an if statement, it's actually like, it's just, it's interesting that like, if you put it in an if statement, it does it then, so you don't have to do it again, right? Like it's, um, it was interesting just to try and go through the example. I, I found that really illuminating uh, to try and get it to work. Yeah, but um, yeah, uh, that was, I, I really enjoyed the presentation and thank you for making a slightly more um, reasonable example of the um, where you go wrong at the end there. Yeah, that was that database example was kind of hard to follow. I thought. Yeah. Yes, the, the, like make your own working directory. Like uh, I'm like I'm not gonna do that. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like I was looking at. It, I was like, you know, finishing this up last night and was like needed something for that and like was like. 
should I just like be lazy and just like put the whole, just drop the whole thing in there? But honestly, like the code would have filled up, like it, like there's like a whole bunch of code, it would have like filled up like multiple slots, like, okay, we're gonna have to pare this down. But yeah, that was, um, honestly, that was one of the most interesting, like I honestly, it's a mistake that you could make and it would be really annoying to figure out the cause if you had those kind of like shared, uh, shared objects. Um, yeah. I also liked the idea that like the value of a field could be another object. I was trying to think of like a good example of that. And I, I didn't, but like, it's like an interesting notion, I guess, you know? Yeah. When you were, when you were talking about, um, the problem with calling a R6, like a, creating an R6 object from a, another class within the, uh, within a field. And you're like saying how it only gets created once and it references the same one. It kind of reminded me of like the function factories uh, statistics examples where you have like, and they don't, they don't have the same reference sem semantics, but it's similar in terms of like, you just call like whatever, like the, 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 like the model building once, and then you like, you like, or you fit it and once, and then you use any predict every time you call the function. And like, uh, I don't know, it's, it reminded me of that. Like it's cause you have like the, the thing you do once kind of first, and then you have an embedded like object or function or whatever. And like, that's the thing that gets called every time, you know? So I don't know. So maybe like it, like you could have an R six object where you do the same thing, where you like use the field to like fit a model or something, and then like make a prediction for every time you call a method or something like that. Yeah, it seems like you could make like if you made R R six objects, um, it would be like they're very user friendly like you could you could build a whole bunch of stuff for someone much like a package you could say well here's my r6 class go ahead and use this and and everything would be there for them uh, much in the way that python kind of puts it there for you um and solve that stuff but like it doesn't really fit very well with the way we code in, in r right like it's just it doesn't make a lot of sense that you would code that way um yeah I, so that's uh that's kind of the only way I think I might use it, but even then I don't, that's not the, not the sense that I take as to like, logically I wouldn't run to it. Um, did you have any thoughts on refer the reference classes? That he uh, talks about briefly at the end, the RRC. I browse that, I think like, yeah, does, does, does anyone else have a, I, I've, I've never even seen that. I don't know if anyone else had like seen reference classes and had opinions. I was like, you're telling me they're similar? You're telling me I don't have to think about them? Great, <laughs> done, done deal. Yeah. I'm gonna not think about them. Honestly, I just like saw that section and I was like, oh, foot <laughs> they look like footnotes, whatever. I'll just... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was like, oh, a bullet pointed list of like, <laughs> in something I've never learned about and you're not going to tell me about? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. He says it's faster to use R6. So I'm like, okay, you sold me. Like, the... Yeah. It was interesting, like, kind of, like, a lot of the chapter, though, he was, uh, like, saying, like, at the beginning, or he's like, you would, like, if you come coming from a different language, like Python, you would want to, like, use this, but don't use it. Like, resist the temptation. Uh, but then, like, in the chat, actually, John uh, Harmon... John the Geek, he said, uh, we were talking, there was a thread in, like uh, uh, in the advanced R group and he said um, about these chapters and he said, what is it, where did he say? Uh, S3 is what you'll probably use, most often use, but a lot, of, a lot of the most powerful stuff is in R6. So it's worth taking the time to learn. So I don't, so I don't know, I want to, I'm interested, I'd be interested in what he, maybe I'll comment on that, but what he means by like what's powerful about it compared to, um, yeah, compared to um, 
S3. Yeah, I wonder if it would like make my life easier or if we could do some really complicated things that I don't know of yet, but it hasn't seemed to come up yet for me. So I thought that I would learn how ggplot works with the last plot. Like if you use ggsave or something, I thought it would be like a R6 or some other method. But uh, looking at the code, it it doesn't look that complicated, and I have no idea what's going on. So maybe maybe it's like something we could tackle as a group. Um, I'll I'll drop the um, drop it in the chat. It might be for the, uh, the R package development group and not not our group. But I, I just really don't understand like what the what the code's doing. Um, there was actually a suggestion in that same thread I was just talking about uh, to like to discuss examples in the wild of like S three R six and uh, sorry, what's the last one? S four. Yeah. So we could talk about it now, or we could also bring a few examples next week and like work through them because it's a short. It's like it's a pretty short chapter. Uh, oh yeah, uh, um, Josh, were you gonna do that? Or who is? Oh, I think it was Eric. Oh, Eric, he's just not here today. Oh, okay, sorry, it's a hard time remembering who said. That's oh, right. I was gonna do it in two weeks. Oh, okay, uh, but, but yeah, we were saying that maybe he would do um, the uh, trade-offs as well as. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is not even that. Uh, long we you shared let me look at it right now but but i think we should also bring in stuff for next sure. next week if you have time just like think about uh examples or find some or uh i think it'd be pretty cool to like talk through them um want me to share the screen or, or uh, sure sure okay. all right uh where is it um this one this is what you shared right yeah. Oh, no, damn it, I came up I forgot to share. All right. All right. Yeah, that's it. So we just the don't G really know what's going on. So so where where in this is called when GG save is called or I just was curious how GG save knows to grab the last plot. Um and right. actually let me see. Where does GG save? So, so it looks like it's it stores an object called last plot, right? And it puts it one level up from the function call. And I'm guessing that at the end of GG plot, it runs plot store. Okay. So this is yeah. So this is the super assignment, right? Yeah. Okay, and then the dot makes it like a, a hidden object. So it, it is kind of accessible by the environment, but it's not yeah. uh, exposed to the user. I see. Yeah, and then there's store, right? It runs store there, which which grabs the last plot. Right. And this is inside um, GG Safe. Uh, this one I'm looking at now. I'm trying to figure out um, kind of how it moves through the the package. Um, I don't remember how I got on this page. To be honest, uh, I just remember kind of stopping here and <laughs> scratching my head. Um, so let's see. Where does some of this go? used I just tried to see if you could access that value or oh dot store I don't know. so can you not even even if you even if you type it into the console you, like it doesn't give you hidden objects it should, it should. Um, I just did like this uh, like I don't think yeah okay just made like a Tibble and then plotted something. 
What's in, um, is there a, a function in ggplot, like uh, hidden functions? Like, can you go to, to do like the triple dot, or sorry, triple colon on ggplot and see if. Um, that? Yeah, and what are we looking for? Like. Oh uh, yeah, you might you might find dot. Plot dot, store. Last plot. Uh, dot. Last. So yes, yeah, plot store or store is there, yeah, because it's a like should it, it should be store, right? Because yeah, store was there as a as a oh wait, I, hidden, I got hidden part of the ggplot. Sorry, I got rid of one. There it is. Yeah. So it's a list with two functions in it. What's actually saving the plot in that value? Well, there's another function, right? Which is last underscore plot, which is the dot store get, which pulls it up and then, and set, right? So there's two of them. Yeah, but I guess I, I don't really see like where it gets, how it gets utilized within the- Yeah, is it, the is it, is it called by GG save somewhere? I guess- I don't see it. Um, yeah, it's confusing. It's just like, I mean, ggplot already looks like magic and then this is just- you know. <laughs> <laughs> Because there's only like maybe like eight lines of code all together. And, so like, uh, is- is last plot used somewhere? Is that what? Because that's the final thing, right? So, all right, so we've last plot. What was the other? We had store. Plot store. Is that what it was? Yeah, and then store. Yeah, they just like don't appear in the in the R, like the .R files. Does last plot appear anywhere or no? There you go. No. Plot is last plot. There you go. Right? In GG save. Thank So it's in the call for it? Yeah, but like how does it how does it know what the last plot is? Well that must that be called that helper function must be called in um in ggplot, right? Oh well, it's down here, right? Yeah, but that like I don't see it. Um well, it's, those are just defining set and get, right? Like, there's got to be within um, in G, within ggplot. It must have like a last plot or something. You can actually store it to do this call plot store in ggplot. Oh, he's got another function called set last plot. Yeah. So the set last plot must run yeah, that at the used. end, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's in ggplot, uh, which is a S3 method. It looks like. Wait, so looking at this bit of code that we originally started on, it kind of looks to me like it's doing something very similar to an R6 method, like to an R6 object, but just not with R6. Because like, I could imagine an R6, uh, this dot store thing, right? Like I could imagine an R6 class that's like plot storage and it has like a, you know, it has like a plot val, it has like a last plot field and it has a get method and a set method, right? And it seems like what this is doing, this dot, this dot plot under dot plot store function is returning a list where one object one element is a function that gets you this dot last plot, and the other one is a function that sets dot last plot, which is like kind yeah. of the same thing as an R6 object, but like not using R6. Yeah, I think it's like in the like in the uh, function factories uh, chapter. It said like you can use the function factors as if an R6 method to store some values. So like this is very simple, so it's okay to use a function factory, but if it it probably get messy if it were bigger. Yeah, like something like this. Like, uh... 
now I think where I'm getting stuck is so set last pot. What isn't the isn't the double assignment in line six? Yeah. It just goes up a level, but that's like inside the function call of of line sixteen. So like, isn't it really just like talking? <laughs> I don't know. I just don't understand like what. Because like that, like uh, in line sixteen, right, like the right side of that is like the inside the environment of the function. Yeah, yeah, function right. Now. So then, like, how does and then it stores that... it? So, right. Okay. Or but it's not returning. It, oh, it it returns this list, right? Or no, does it? No, it doesn't. No, sorry, <laughs> it's a function. So dot store here is a function. No, I think, so this is like yes. when do you need a function? No, it's, a, it's, it's a list of two functions. Oh, it's, it's a list of two functions, yes. Yeah. Wait, but that's that's what, oh, but so that's the function factory bit, right? It's yeah. a list of two functions, but yeah. those functions are like equivalent to function factories kind of. So like what's happening in this in this get function is it's accessing the execution environment of the call to dot plot underscore store and like looking at that to get the value of dot last plot. Like that lives in the execution environment that was like frozen there. That like similarly to function factories, right? Is that the idea or is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 So it seems like there is a, a dot last plot that is in the environment of dot store, right? Inside the environment of, um, with the, the list of two functions, right? Because it's defined there at the start of dot plot underscore store. So that when you're pushing it up two levels, Jake, it seems like you're just, you're changing that dot last plot inside that dot store environment which seems extremely confusing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this isn't the first time I've spent like a good amount of time just staring at this page, but. Well, we're I'm getting curious, closer I'm to curious if like he were to redo this today, if he would use a, an R, or that team, there's three people, if they would use an R6 instead. Mm -hmm. um, Or just keep it as is, but yeah, I uh, appreciate you taking. <laughs> Didn't he say he would redo ggplot and like he, this is the one that he, if he could change things, he would not be using the pluses, right? He yeah. used pipe, he used pipes, which is all built from R6. So is that not what this chapter said about R6 and pipes being related? Maybe. It I didn't actually read it this week. I read it a little while ago, so I can't comment. What I remember is he said the chaining is similar to piping, like uh, method chaining. Um, but I don't know. I don't. I didn't catch anything where he was talking about like what it's what like Magadar or whatever is built on. I yeah, know. I feel like this is actually like a pretty interesting. Uh, PC put together just talking about like why plus signs and not pipes. Um, so I didn't know, I didn't know he was interested in switching it over. Yeah, he says, I think that was one of his, his regrets is in, in our development is using pluses for ggplot and then pipes later on. Um, I think I've heard him a couple times now talk about how if he was to redo it, he would use pipes just because it's consistent then. Yeah, that bit of code is really confusing, though. Like, I feel like I have, like, a 75 or 70 percent understanding of it now. Like, I I feel like I know what concept it's related to, right, with the function fact. Like, I think the function factory bit and stuff is right. But um, it's honestly, like, it's still, it's, like, a really confusing bit of code. <laughs> if you ask me, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write it if I wanted anyone to ever read that. So... I think, yeah, what's still confusing about it for me as well is that, like, 
the that dot last plot uh, val, uh, object is like initialized as null, and then it's like only exists in the function environment. Or yeah, in the. Well, I think it just nulls itself out and like resets each time. So it just like. Right. Each time it, it, it's called, it nulls itself and then gets called and set to, to then be placed in the store, mm -hmm. the store value. Wait, but I, I think that that's the null is just the default value. Like when you're creating the store, it's just like if you, ha if this is an R6 class, maybe this is what you're saying and I'm misunderstanding, but like if, if it was an R6 class, I would have my plot store class and I would initialize the last plot field to be null. And then I'd have like an, like I'd have a method that would say, you know, set this thing and it would, it would overwrite it. Like I would set it and then I could set it again and it would, you know, set it to something else. And in this, you call dot plot under dot plot store and it is creates this, you, it saves the execution environment of, Mm -hmm. of these two functions that are in that list, which both have dot last plot in it. And then it's going through that environment to grab and change what dot last plot is. Like, I think that's somewhat what it's doing. I guess what's confusing about, maybe it's confusing because we just did R6, but like that anytime you set anything, you have to save it to another object or else you can't set and then get on store without saving it somewhere else first. You know yeah, I mean? no, I see what you're saying now. Like, like they can't talk to each other. Like you have to do something else outside of that function environment to then have get and set refer to each other or whatever. Like, like how would get ever be anything other than, that? oh, cause it's, cause you're doing store, okay. Oh my God, all right. <laughs> It's using this with uh, presumably throughout, like every time it adds a line or something, it's you know, like or you add another section to the plot, it grabs the plot, figures out what it wants to do, and then sets it right. It, so then, like the GG save part is just the last iteration of using the set. Uh huh. Yeah. I assume that's how it works. I. This is I awesome. I, I, it's like I feel like this is really helpful to see real examples. Like. Some of the stuff we've been doing. All right, well, I have to run over to the uh, the Biostats book club, but thanks very much, Ezra. This was great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Guys have a good night. Thank you all. Have a good night. I'm going to head out too. I have to go eat some pizza. Yeah, <laughs> nice. All right, thank you. All right. See you guys.